I obviously didn't live at this time period and unfortunately everyone who lived at that time period has passed away and if they have not passed away um, that is even more concerning because that it, they would be extremely old. What's up guys, it's Oakley also known as Wolad and today I have some messy hair of course as always. I try to just ignore like the background, it's kind of weird. I have a random creepy open door in the background which I could try to like sit in front of. I don't think that's really gonna work. So yeah, I'm just gonna tell you to ignore that. Um, <laughs> so basically in today's video, I'm gonna be talking about the history of telephones. Um, let's just hop into this right now. And um, so I did all this research on my own. It's kind of just like a brief overview of the history of telephones. So the first thing that we really have to take note of is the telegraph, because if it weren't for the telegraph, we would not have phones because that one invention in and of itself was the first spark in every inventor's mind into what a telephone could be. So let's get to it. In 1843, the American government financed the construction of the first telegraphic communication line, which was inaugurated a year later between Washington and Baltimore. The first message in history was transmitted May 24th, 1844 at 8.45 a.m. So this was using Morse code, um, named after Mr. Morse himself. <laughs> so Morse and Washington telegraphed to this guy in Baltimore. He said, what hath God wrought? This phrase comes from the Bible and it is a common term for saying um, something basically like, what has God done? And it's not like in a really creepy way because when I was first reading this, um, history tends to be kind of ominous. So when I heard that, I was like, whoa, creepy. But no, basically um, it means what has God done in like a cool way, in a way of expressing awe. So basically there's a lot of different information on the telegraph. What was the first telegraphic message sent? When you look it up, uh, what I just said is the first thing that shows up. Although if you do a little bit more digging, um, you hear a lot of different stories. Uh, this was the time when the first commercial telegraph was sent. This was the time when the first telegraph uh, communication line was completed. Um, this was the first telegraph used for the railway. So I'm just basically gonna include the other thing that I heard about. So the first, let's just say the first main telegraph message was sent um, in 1837 in London. It was for a railway, so it wasn't like a regular communication type of thing. So the telegraph really became popular for people who had businesses, for people who, who were working on railways, who were working in ministries, who might have been working in newspapers sometimes also internationally important corporations, and of course the rich, because if you could afford a telegraph, um, you would have one. You could afford uh, a telegram, telegraph, yeah. If you could afford a telegram, no, if you could afford a telegraph, you probably had one because like, I'm sure it was like a really awesome, cool thing to have at the time. Um, it was definitely like one of the first like real, ways to share information kind of quickly over usually like a big like over a big distance <laughs> i don't know why that word took so long to come out of my mouth yeah up until now it was mainly um postage and it was still mainly postage so this wasn't really the main means of communication at the time it was just um it was just another means of communication the telegram um, used for sending Morse code messages. That was uh, Morse code was developed specifically for the Bell Telegram. The people who used and had these devices were usually of some importance, like I just had mentioned. Now, kind of moving away from telegrams a little bit. So, acoustic telephone. So, by means of a taut string, a tight string, the most commonly known device from this era is the tin can telephone or the lover's telephone. Speaking tubes were also commonly known and are still sometimes used in buildings or ships. So one of the first to patent the telephone as an apparatus for transmitting vocal or other sounds telegraphically 
was Alexander Graham Bell. There's a lot of controversy on who invented the telephone um, independently. So I'm not going to dive into that because there is a lot of superstition. I don't know. I, I don't think that's the right place of that word. Um, there's just a lot of controversy. There's a lot of um, debate. So yeah, it's kind of, uh, we don't really know exactly who helped to bring about the design of the phone. But from the research that I did, it definitely was not just Alexander Graham Bell. Although he was the one who got the patents and basic and basically for a while, um, nobody else was able to touch anything that was like related to a phone, like, you know, tinker with the design and all that. In the late 1800s, around the same time when telephones began to kind of pop up by Alexander Graham Bell, because he had the patent, so he was the guy pushing it out, pretty sure. Um, so in the late 1800s, these acoustic phones that I mentioned before, they were a competitor to the electric ones. Um, they were a lot cheaper and yeah, they were just, you know, easier to get. You are my At least that was before Bell's telephone patents expired, allowing for new telephone manufacturers to begin competing. When this finally occurred, it ended up pushing acoustic telephones out of business. Overall, due to a much larger range, the telephone shone brightly enough to leave the acoustic phones in its wake. This is the main step we have going from telegrams to telephone. So first there's, um, we have the telegram, the electric telegram, the acoustic telephone, and then the electric telephone. Um, that is really where it seemed like it all began. I don't claim to know everything. Before the invention of the telephone switchboard, sometimes pairs of telephones were connected directly with each other, which was usually the case for business owners who wanted to connect a phone to their home. So I don't really know if um, most of the time this even needed electricity because basically what they would do is just string like a wire. I think maybe they did need electricity. I'm not like a chemistry major or like whatever. <laughs> so I don't know, but I know that they had a wire that connected from their business to their house. The relay of information can happen in a few different ways. The telegraph, for example, worked on a mainly store and forward basis meaning that information from a that meaning information or a telegram message would be sent to an intermediate station to be kept and then sent at a later time to either the final destination or to another station so the way that telephones differed from this was that telephone exchanges were usually in offices where workers known as operators would connect a small area together with their phone service through subscriber lines which went from the customer's home to the provider's network so of course instead of keeping a telegram message which was morse code and then forwarding that later to um the person who the message is for um telephones didn't seem to work like that um even at the beginning so it was basically you would dial up the operator you would ask the operator to talk to someone or ask for a specific place and they would give you that place and they would forward you to them. Switchboard is the equipment that was used to connect subscribers together in a telephone exchange. The first commercial telephone exchange, starting with only 21 subscribers, took place January 1878 in New Haven, Connecticut. This idea for a telephone exchange was inspired by the telegram exchange. This though was 41 years later. So this was even still before Alexander Graham Bell's patents expired. This first switchboard could connect as many as 64 customers. Like I said, although at that time they only had 21, even though um, they could connect as many as 64 customers. Only two conversations could be handled at once because six connectors were needed for each call. 
So basically each, each connector served a different purpose, like one served the purpose of ringing the bell, the other served the purpose of transmitting the sound, the other served the purpose of sending their sound out, um, you know, stuff like that. These subscribers had to pay a dollar and fifty cents a month, which is today's equivalence of a hundred dollars a month. It was kind of a lot of money and obviously a lot of people didn't have this money and no one really needed a telephone because nobody else had a telephone, right? Like who are you going to talk, who are you going to call if you're the only one with a phone? <laughs> And who's gonna call you if you're the only one with a phone? A month later, there were now 50 subscribers. Mostly it was businesses, doctors, post office workers, and the police. So although no one could call them and ask for the police, the police still ended up buying um, subscriptions from these guys and becoming subscribers or whatever. <laughs> so um, yeah, even some of the workers at this company ended up buying. Three years later, this blew up. So only three years later, in 1880, the company grew so fast. It literally grew so fast. The company was given the right away to service all of Connecticut and even Western Massachusetts. Now taking the new name of Connecticut Telephone, later changing to the name of Southern New England Telephone in 1882. So this really is where things blew up and just everyone started getting a phone. It was really just up there, you know, things were really, things were really going on. Now we get to how things start changing. Now we have the phone it's already been established. We already know how it works. People are calling each other. People are paying like $100 a month. Um, I'm only guessing that the, um, the price kind of went down a little bit, although I'm not too sure. So even though around this time, not everybody still had a phone, of course, it was just a lot more people than before had phones. So in 1885, that was when the long, the first long distance telephone network started in New York City. Um, I'm not too sure if it was the first, cause like I said, there's so much information on there, but it was when the long distance telephone network finally started in New York City. In 1887, the first multiplex switchboard was introduced as the range for long distance telephones were expanded when, their, um, when this company's lines finally reached Chicago in 1892 so that was barely really 10 years later after um the southern new england telephone company started blowing up connecticut to chicago um a lot more uh states were really being covered by telephone companies um it was very interesting. It wasn't until 1893 and 1894 when things really started to drastically change after a Alexander Graham Bell's patents, got the word right, <laughs> when his patents finally expired. So this was when acoustic telephones quickly went out of style in place of the now popular and the highly competitive electric phones who began to compete and develop much more after these patents expired. Here's when we really get into um, the world starting to be interconnected, phones really starting to improve, everything really starting to just look <laughs> in the future with these phones. By 1904, 1904, this is, I'm pretty sure about like 20 or 25 years later, over 3 million phones in the US were in telephone exchanges. 10 years later from this, in 1914, the US was the world leader in telephone density in the world, bro, underline the world, surpassing Sweden, who was previously in the lead. The commercial popularity of telephones was true even despite competing telephone networks not interconnecting. So that is very interesting. So basically like if your grandma lived in like let's say Chicago and you lived in Connecticut and she had a different phone company than you, you would not be able to call her. So yep, there you are writing your letters again. 
Um, I'm not too sure how long distance communication was, even though it was just um, from this state to that state. I think it was still like kind of okay. I'm not too sure. We will be talking um, about like actual long distance communication in a second. So with the introduction of loading coils, which helped to fix distortion, more lines were reaching Denver and Colorado by 1911. In 1915, the first coast-to-coast -coast long distance telephone call was between New York City and San Francisco, California, bro. They were really interconnecting and shit. So January 6th of 1927, the first test of commercial telephone lines across the Atlantic Ocean. It was tested and proven successful it was proven successful from London to m motherfucking New York City. This unscripted um, test call, and it was this guy saying, Distance doesn't mean anything anymore. We are on the verge of a very high speed world. But, like, this was crazy. Like, things were really changing and shit. Like, like when I when I was doing my research, I was up at like 6 a.m. I couldn't sleep for some reason. I was like, this sounds like a great video idea. Let me just do this research. So when I read that, um, I was like, it gave me like, what is it called? It gave me goosebumps to that. I was like, oh my God. Like I know it was like a little over a hundred years ago, but the like how much technology has improved in a hundred years is literally mind-blowing it is literally mind-blowing and that is why i'm like making this video i'm gonna talk a little bit more about that at the end of this video and in another video so let's just get back onto this so this call was not transmitted through wire um it was transmitted rather through radio waves so this was kind of new um people really started to explore how sound could travel through radio waves um it's very, it was very interesting. Um, I don't know too much about it, but yeah, I'm just pretty sure that that is what happened. Thus, the people of these two great cities will be brought within speaking distance. Across 3,000 miles of ocean, individuals in the two cities may, by telephone, exchange views and transact business instantly, as though they were face to face. <clears throat> I know that it is your aim, as it is ours, to extend this service so that in the near future, anyone in either of our countries may talk to anyone in the other. No one can foresee the ultimate significance of this latest achievement of science and organization. It will certainly facilitate business. It will be a social convenience and comfort. And through the closer bond which it establishes, it will promote better understanding and strengthen the ties of friendship. Through the spoken word, aided by the personality of the voice, the people of New York and the people of London will become neighbors in a real sense, below separated by thousands of miles. We are glad to have cooperated with you in this notable enterprise and shall actively continue to work with you in extending and improving the service. Paul had taken place on the 7th of January and was recorded and prepared beforehand. So after this call, lines were open for personal and business uses, and by the end of that one day, over $6 million worth of business transactions had taken place between Great Britain and New York City. That is insane. That is crazy. So however, these long distance calls were not placed from their own telephones at home, but rather one would make an appointment to use a special soundproofed long distance telephone booth. If they had the money, they would go to these places, rent out the booth and make a long distance telephone call. That is crazy. It kind of seemed like the design and use of the telephone really did not change much at all. Um, the design changed, yes, but the functionality of phones really kind of remained the same. And so basically it just seemed like what ended up happening after the 20s, 
phones kind of remained the same. I'm sure there were new smaller inventions. The design of the telephone continued to change. In the 1890s, um, that is when the candlestick telephone was very popular. It was the only, it was really the only um, design of the phone at the time. So I'm pretty sure there was a, um, a separate ringer box and then the actual telephone itself. It wasn't until the 1920s that the rotary telephone began to replace the candlestick design. And then later on in the 1960s, with the new invention of the touch tone, um, that was when the rotary telephone design kind of started to fade away as this new touch tone um, dial pad design began to replace it. In the 1930s, the standard telephone had a bell connected rather than a separate ringer box. I'm pretty sure the candlestick and probably the early rotary phones had a different box where um, their ringer would go through. So as phone designs began to develop, they ended up integrating that bell into the phone itself. Power was also supplied to each subscriber by um, their central office batteries instead of user local ones, which needed continual service. So basically, I'm pretty sure what that means is like the person that was like their telephone company, they used to come over to the house to like fix the phone battery and the power source and whatever, which used to break a lot. So basically the, the phone companies were like, you know what, we are just gonna supply you that power. And yeah, so that's what ended up happening. So for the next half of a century, the networks behind the telephones grew progressively larger and became much more efficient. The designs didn't really start to change much until the 1960s, as I mentioned, when the dial touch model was introduced. Telephone exchange was inspired by the telegram exchange. So that is really when things started to change in the ways of communication completely. I really just had to kind of make a video about this just so I could get myself to do research. It's probably gonna be one of my most um, like hard worked on videos. Is that English? If you even stayed this long into the video, you know, tell me what you think below. And I will probably make another video um, where I go into mobile telephones, bro. I already did a little bit of research on it. It gets even more intense. Um, there's a lot of different information. There's a lot of different people. But it is also really interesting because I didn't want to stop this whole like mini series that I kind of want to work on and just stop at telephones. No, um, basically I kind of want to go over the history kind of briefly. I'm like, I'm not, this isn't a classroom, you know, we're just trying to learn a little bit about it, um, get a better understanding about it, not like overwork our minds, trying to wrap our, our minds around every single fact and figure about phones. No, uh, I just want to make like two or three videos on the history of telephones and then move on to discussing where we are now and especially get into the early 2000s and how mobile telephones really started to change everything. So that is where I gotta end this video today. It was really cool doing all of this research. If you liked it, please give me a thumbs up so like, you know, you can support me. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep my opinions out of this video for now. Um, but in the next videos, I'm really excited to really get into that and really express how I feel with all of this and really just learn more through the process of making these videos. So yeah, if you like this video, please support me, um, leave a comment or a like, and subscribe. So I'll see you in the next video. If I do make more videos, they will be down below in the description. So thank you very much. Peace.